In today's MLB, we typically associate the offseason with free agency, a time where some of the game's best players can control their own destiny and get the payday that they deserve. But it wasn't always this way. Up until about 50 years ago, MLB players were completely at the mercy of their respective ball clubs. They couldn't negotiate with other MLB teams, they had almost no say about if or when they'd be traded, and they most certainly couldn't just declare free agency like today's players do. Instead, they were at the mercy of MLB's reserve clause, a legal precedent that had haunted the players basically since the league's inception. But in the late 1960s, the winds of change started to come for Major League Baseball, as some of the league's best players decided that they had had enough of how they were being bought and sold. However, it would take someone incredibly brave to stand up to Major League Baseball and challenge this rather ridiculous status quo. And in 1970, a player by the name of Kurt Flood did just that. This is the story of how a single trade took MLB to the Supreme Court and simultaneously set in motion the events that would lead to MLB free agency. This is Sports Oddity. The year was 1969, and Kurt Flood was in the middle of a fantastic run with the St. Louis Cardinals. After being traded to St. Louis prior to the 1958 season, Flood had spent the previous 12 seasons establishing himself as one of the faces of the Cardinals franchise. In fact, at a time when the Redbirds were seemingly on top of the baseball world, Flood was not only a lineup staple out in center field, but he was also a fan favorite and a team captain with respect all around the game. And it wasn't that hard to see why. From 1963 to 1969, Flood would win a gold glove every single season. And in that same time frame, he would also make three all-star appearances and earn MVP votes in six of those seven seasons. Oh, and he also won two World Series. While I don't think anyone would make the argument that he was the best player in baseball or even on his own team at the time, Kurt Flood was still an immensely important piece to the 1960s Cardinals and a big reason why they had won two straight NL pennants heading into the 1969 season. But while he had the support of the fans and his teammates behind him, his relationship with management had started to become fraught by the end of 1968. During the 1968 World Series, the normally reliable Flood made a costly error on a ball hit over his head in center field, a mistake that would allow the Tigers to score three runs and eventually win Game 7 and the series. That offseason, Flood was expecting a big pay raise from management. After all, he was coming off the two best offensive seasons of his career and he had just finished fourth in MVP voting just a few weeks previously. But when the time came to actually discuss salary, team owner Gussie Bush was only willing to offer him $5,000 extra, less than a third than what he was expecting. Flood believed that this was the owner's way of getting back at him for his mistake in Game 7. And while he eventually got the $90,000 salary that he was requesting, this led to some bad blood between the two, who were previously close friends. And that bad blood would continue to boil into 1969. Before the season even began, Flood was one of several Cardinals players who boycotted games during spring training in an effort to secure more pension funds for the players. And later on that year, Flood would again draw the ire of management by publicly criticizing them after they made major changes to the organization before the team was even eliminated from the playoffs that year. It also didn't help matters that the Cardinals were struggling mightily that season only finishing fourth in the newly created NL East. And even though Flood put up numbers that were remarkably similar to his 1968 season, the only thing that really mattered to baseball people at the time was batting average, and that had dipped a little bit. It wasn't much, but it was enough to make him expendable, 
that, alongside his high salary and his testy relationship with management, made him an ideal trade candidate for the Cardinals. And after the 1969 season, he was sent along to the Phillies in a multiplayer deal. Naturally, Flood was furious with this decision. Not only did he believe St. Louis to be his home, but of all the places he could have been sent to, Philadelphia was one of the last places he would ever want to play. Not only were the Phillies generally lousy year after year, but their fans were also well known for being quite racist. So on Christmas Eve in 1969, Flood wrote one of the most important and consequential letters in Major League Baseball history to then-Commissioner Bowie Kuhn in an attempt to be released from his contract. In his letter, Flood wrote, I do not feel I am a piece of property to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes. I believe I have the right to consider offers from other clubs before making any decision. Like many Major League players, Flood had an issue with MLB's reserve clause, which essentially gave teams the ability to keep their players' rights for their entire careers. At that time, when you signed a Major League contract, you had no say of if, when, or where you'd be traded, and you couldn't talk to any other teams even if your contract had expired. It was a system deliberately built by and for the team owners with the explicit purpose to keep down player salaries, and it was a system that has been in place ever since the beginning of MLB. The Supreme Court even upheld this system in 1922 when they ruled that MLB was exempt from the antitrust and collusion legislation that this system obviously broke. But now seemed like a pretty good time to revisit that case and its decision. So when Commissioner Kuhn predictably denied Flood's request, Flood took him to court in New York, setting up one of the most consequential court cases in MLB history. On one side was Commissioner Kuhn, and in turn, the very wealthy team owners that he represented. On the other was Flood, who, unfortunately for him, was mostly alone on this fight. Sure, he had the unanimous backing of the Players Association behind him, but publicly, he didn't have any big-name players vouching for him or his ideas in the press out of fear of their careers. So while he had some key witness testimony from former players such as Jackie Robinson and Hank Greenberg, the lack of current star power forming behind Flood's case made it especially difficult for Flood and his legal team to create any leverage. As such, both the Southern District of New York and the Second Circuit Court of Appeals both sided with MLB and upheld the Supreme Court's 1922 ruling. In the two years that this case was being fought, Flood was actually granted his release from the Cardinals, and he spent a very short stint in 1971 with the Washington Senators. But at that point, especially with the court case going the way it was going, he knew that the writing was on the wall and that his career was all but over. And so he did the one thing that he could do at that point. He took his case to the Supreme Court, and by a stroke of luck, they actually granted him certiorari. But unfortunately for Flood, that would be the extent of his good news. In a 5-3 decision, the Supreme Court once again ruled in favor of Major League Baseball, even though they themselves would admit that their rationale was flimsy at best. Justice Harry Blackman, who delivered the majority opinion for the court, even concedes in his opinion that baseball's claim to an antitrust exemption didn't make any legal sense. But because of the huge role that MLB played in American society at the time and the precedent set by the previous court, they felt like they had to side with MLB. After all of this, it can be easy to think that Kurt Flood got absolutely nothing out of it. After all, not only did he lose the case and both appeals, but his career was basically destroyed in the process and he was receiving death threats constantly as a result of it. But in reality, Kurt Flood was one of the only ones brave enough to stand up and fight in a battle that was much closer to being won than people realized. Flood vs. Kuhn brought a lot of attention to the issues of the reserve clause, both inside and outside of baseball circles. And it gave the Players Association the opportunity to finally put an end to this system once and for all. 
1973, the MLBPA negotiated a new rule with MLB stating that players who had been in the league for 10 years and played for a team for five straight seasons could determine whether or not they wanted to be traded, a rule that would come to be known as the Kurt Flood Rule. Two years later, the site's decision would effectively end the reign of the reserve clause in Major League Baseball. And finally, in 1976, the Players Association and MLB came to a collective bargaining agreement that finally brought free agency as we know it today. The final piece of the puzzle would come in 1998, when President Bill Clinton would sign into law the Curt Flood Act, named after the recently deceased Flood, which effectively ended baseball's antitrust exemption, which it had held for 76 years. We often hear that one man can make a difference, and I'm hard pressed to find a better example than Kurt Flood. Even though it ended up badly for him, his Christmas Eve letter in 1969 set in motion a chain of events which would change the course of baseball history forever, and ultimately end a system that had exploited players since the beginning of the game. Flood may not have been the greatest player to ever play the game, but he is certainly one of the most important figures in the sport and he deserves to be remembered as such. Thank you for watching this episode of Sports Oddity. If you liked what you saw, be sure to like this video and subscribe down below if you're new. Also, if you're in the mood for more baseball content, be sure to check us out on our website, readthediamond.com, and follow us on social media, at the Diamond US on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.